This is Bible Institute lesson number four. We've looked at the gap. Now we've been looking at the beings that were on the earth in that gap. First, we looked at the cherubim. We looked at the seraphim. Now we're just going to look at the regular angels. And obviously the name, angels, how many? Innumerable company. What's their job? Well, some are warriors. Probably all of them are warriors. They're messengers and guardians. A spiritual state, some holy and sinless, some fallen and rebellious. Their habitation, third heaven. The angels of God are third heaven. The angels that rebelled with Satan is second heaven and the earth. And then the angels that sinned in the days of Noah are under darkness. So some are in the third heaven, some are in the second heaven and the earth, some are under darkness. And the appearance, they look like regular men so much that you can entertain them unawares. That's their appearance. Meaning no wings or halos. Nothing really that would make them look any different than a regular man. So angels are God's creation. They are individuals with names, personalities, free will. Some choose holiness and some choose wickedness. And Hebrews 12, 22 says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So there's an innumerable company of angels, and they look just like regular men. Now there's some with names. Well, they all got names, but there's only a, some, just a few that's named in the Bible. One of them is Michael the Archangel. And Michael means who is like God. And you'll notice that the names of these angels have seven letters. Michael has seven letters. Seven is a number of perfection. And the, the Bible speaks of one archangel. And that's Michael. It never actually calls Gabriel an archangel. It seems uh, Michael's main job is being the helper of Israel. In Daniel 10, 13, it says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So Michael is one of the helpers of Israel. It's his main thing. Notice it calls Michael one of the chief princes. So this leads you to believe there are, are more angels of higher rank that just aren't mentioned. And the Bible calls Lucifer the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2. 2. Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there is a order and rank to the spirit world. You got chief princes. Lucifer is called the prince of the power of the air. Michael is the archangel. So there's a certain rank or order to it. And Daniel 12, 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So Michael stands up for Israel. He stands for the children of thy people, it says. That's just more proof he's connected with Israel. And Jude, the book of Jude in verse 9, is actually where it calls him an archangel. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Many are led to believe that Michael is of lesser power than Lucifer because of this verse, but maybe Michael just knows the schedule of when he's supposed to prevail over the dragon, and it wasn't at that time. 
But you see there that Michael is contending. And in that same little epistle, it talks about earnestly contending for the faith. And that's what Michael's doing. He's contending. So that's what angels do is they, they're contending. That's what me and you need to be doing, contending for the faith. And even though many of the angels failed back there and went along with Lucifer in that gap, God didn't throw the angels out. Notice they still have a job all the way, up, all the way throughout the Bible. That shows you that God just didn't do away with the whole, the whole race of angels just because some of them messed up. He continued to use them. And <clears throat> in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, talks about Michael the archangel again. And it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So these verses also show that Michael has angels under him, and the devil has angels under him. So Michael prevails. So does this mean he's stronger? Maybe, or possibly the Lord allowed him to knock Satan down, just like you see small armies defeating big armies with the help of God in the Old Testament. Really, whoever God's helping the most is strongest. Michael has something to do with the resurrection from the dead also. And as you read in Jude verse 9, he contended with the devil about the body of Moses. And also, again, in Daniel, you'll see that he's got something to do with the resurrection. In Daniel 12, 1 through 2, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So you see that? He's, he's connected with the resurrection there. Then in First Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Once again, he's connected with the he's connected with the rapture there, and that would be Michael, not Gabriel. It's not the voice of Gabriel, it's the voice of the archangel. And the only archangel in the Bible that you see is Michael. So he's the helper of Israel, and he is got something to do with the resurrection of saints. So that's Michael, the archangel there. And another named angel is Gabriel. Notice again his name, seven letters. And his name means God is my strength. And even though he isn't called an archangel, he still seems to hold a very high position because uh, Luke 119 says, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. So he stands in the presence of God. He's got a high ranking there. And in Daniel 921 it says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel... And I notice it calls angels man, young men, young man. It always refers to them as male, never a woman, never sexless. Because, you know, the average person believes that they're women or the more educated type guys believe that they're sexless. But they're always called uh, men or man. So angels are men. They look just like regular men. It says, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. Daniel 9, 21, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, 
being caused to fly swiftly, touch me about the time of the evening ablation. So Gabriel can fly without wings. In Daniel 9, 22 through 23, it says, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So, remember, Daniel's extremely wise. So, if Gabriel can give him information, skill, and understanding that he doesn't have, then he must be pretty sharp himself. Notice also, he can interact with Daniel. He can talk his language. Gabriel's main job seems to be giving out information straight from the Lord. Uh, just like in that verse where it said in Daniel or in Luke 119, it says, And am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. So he has information straight from the Lord. So you see, just because God's original plan of having a universe filled with sinless angels and cherub and seraphim was canceled because of many of their choices to rebel, he didn't stop using the ones that chose to follow him. And you'll see him use these angels all the way throughout the scriptures. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now me and you aren't heirs of salvation. We got it as an undeserved free gift. But someone will be an heir of salvation in the future. For example, those who take off the tree of life and eat in eternity and get eternal life from it, just like Adam and Eve were going to do. You see, that tree comes back in eternity. There's going to be people eating off that tree. So maybe the angels will still be leading or still are going to be having a job and leading people to that in eternity leading people to that tree <clears throat> so they're still going to have a job throughout eternity they've got a job now that god is using them for the next thing is angels carry out god's judgment in psalm seventy-eight forty-nine, it says he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. And now I used to always think this had to refer to angels that sinned and were just evil, like really evil. So therefore God was using them in a similar way that he does the devil. You know how he'll use the devil as his rod. And just as a way to judge someone who needed judgment. However, it doesn't necessarily have to be evil angels in the sense of sinful because look at Amos 3, 6. It says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? You see that? It says, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? So perhaps these uh, angels are evil in that sense. They're just bringing these horrible things on people as a judgment because of God's wrath on them. But at the same time, it could also be evil angels, angels that sinned, and God is just using them as a weapon to bring out his judgment. Uh, just like in Revelation nine fourteen through 15, it says, saying to the sixth, sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So you see angels at work in the tribulation doing God's judgment, blowing the trumpets, and being loosed out of the great river Euphrates and slaying a third part of men. God allows them to wreak havoc as a judgment on the earth. So we've already seen they were used Back in Daniel's day, in the Old Testament, under the law, uh, you see them used in the tribulation, you see them used in eternity. Another thing, angels can travel the heavens. 
very quickly. It says in uh, Genesis 28, 12, talking about Jacob, and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and de descending on it. So they can travel the heavens without a spaceship. They're a lot more advanced on that than uh, NASA ever will be. You also have reaper angels. In Matthew 13, 39, it says, The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And in Luke 16, 22, when it's talking, in Luke 16, it talks about the rich man, Lazarus. You know, the rich man goes to hell. And then Lazarus goes to the comfort side. And the angels carry him into Abraham's bosom. It says in Luke 16, 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So we know at least at one time when a saint died, they would be carried to paradise. And most likely the rich man was carried over to the torment side as well. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure if that's going on today or if it's just like you... You know, when you close your eyes in death as a saint, you just open them up in the third heaven with the Lord. But uh, possibly, maybe they do the same thing, carry you up to the third heaven. But there are reaper angels. There are king angels. Once again, there's angels with different ranks. In Revelation 9-11, it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So uh, that's uh, Apollyon. He, he's another named angel. And uh, when you uh, hear a lot of talk about angels and they say that there's two named angels in the Bible, really, this is an angel too. I know there's different uh, theories about who he is, and a lot of people don't include him as uh, an angel. But it seems that he is an angel himself, and his name is Abaddon or Apollyon, which means destroyer. And you also have guardian angels. In Matthew 18.10, it says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So it seems that it seems that most likely that guardian angels had more to do with Israel and how God operated under the Old Testament. Because you see, in the Old Testament, they weren't sealed until the day of redemption. They didn't have a complete word of God. Um, the work of Jesus Christ had not been done yet. And you could go on forever and ever with a list of benefits that me and you have that people did not have before the cross. And I don't know for sure, but it doesn't seem like me and you as saints today have a guardian angel like this today. I wouldn't argue with you either way. It just it doesn't seem like we would. And that sounds like a huge bummer, I know, because that would be pretty cool. I mean, I think it would be really cool if you if there was an angel that followed me around named you know, with a cool name like Raphael or Donatello or Michelangelo or Master Splinter or whatever you'd name him. And that would be really cool, so it's a huge bummer that if we don't. But actually, think about this. We actually have something way better than an average run-of-the-mill guardian angel. Look at this. In Acts 27, 22, and 23, it says, And I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve. That's Paul talking, and that's Paul's guardian angel there, the angel of God. He said, the angel of God stood by me this night. So the angel of God is the angel of the Lord. This wasn't just a regular angel, because Paul said he belonged to this angel. He said, whose I am. He showed allegiance to it, to it by saying, whom I serve. And uh, Paul himself warned you in Colossians 2.18 not to be worshiping angels. 
So he's not going to be, <clears throat> he's not going to be saying he serves an angel unless it's not your average run-of-the-mill angel. So we know this isn't so just some regular old angel here. This was God. And you find the angel of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. You saw him appear to Moses in a burning bush. You saw him come and eat with Abraham at his tent. You saw him in the fiery furnace with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And Paul said, the angel of God stood with him. So we got something better than a guardian angel. We got the angel of God. You literally have the Lord himself indwelling you at all times, sitting right next to you at all times. That's something they didn't have in the Old Testament. They didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them, sealing them. The Holy Spirit could come and go in them. In Colossians 1.27 it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is in you. So as much as I'd like to believe, I had two bodyguard angels with an awesome sword and cool names following me around at all times. Maybe I do. Maybe the Lord does still do that, has guardian angels around us. But I know for sure I got the angel of God, which is even better. I don't need the run-of-the-mill angels. No disrespect to them. They're a lot more powerful than I am, way more cooler than I am. <coughs> but I don't need them because I've got the complete word of God. I've got the Holy Ghost dwelling inside me. And even Peter said in 2 Peter 1.18... It says we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. You see, the written word of God is something else that I have. It makes me not need that uh, ministry of angels that they had to have in the Old Testament, giving information to them and stuff. I got the word of God wrote out for me. It's already ready for me right there. It's ready for you right there. You just got to pick it up and read it. The written word of God is a more sure thing than an audible voice speaking to me. If Gabriel came and spoke to me right now, it would be a lot less reliable than this Bible in my hand. In Colossians, you see, we are warned against worshiping angels. And in Galatians, we're warned against believing a false gospel from an angel. It says in Galatians 1, 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It could be that the closing out of the church age, that the, the last days of the church age, that there will be more angel activity that will take place as they transition into the tribulation where there's going to be a lot of angel activity that will take place. And possibly even false gospels from angels. You know, you already seen it, a little glimpse of it. Joseph Smith, the guy that brought you the Mormon stuff, the angel Moroni appeared to him and gave him, or he claims, a, he appeared to him, gave him a false gospel. So possibly as a transition into the tribulation where things will operate more by sight than they do now, maybe in the latter days of the church age, you're going to see more angel activity. But we got the angel of God living inside us. But there are also delivering angels. Angels that deliver. The two angels who visited Lot seem to be a type of angels that the Lord uses to deliver. It says in 2 Peter 2, 6 and 7, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So, delivered just Lot. God used the angels to get Lot out of Sodom. They even had to use their angelic powers to keep him safe while he was there. In Genesis 19, 11, you know, the men are, are, are trying to get in and, and get Lot, beat him up, and everything else. They're trying to have sex with the angels and everything else. It says, and they sm uh, the, but the angels smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, 
so that they wearied themselves to find the door. So the angels have powers and they can use them on men if God allows it. And Genesis 19, 15 through 16, it says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. So they went as far as taking them by hand. And that shows you that angels aren't some type of just fantasy spirit beings who can't interact with physical objects. They, they took Lot and his wife by the hand. But at the same time, since angels are spirits, they aren't bound by the physical world like we are either. It says in Psalm 104 and verse 4, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. You see, in Acts 12, 7, an angel broke Peter out of a locked prison. An angel could just go in there, go through the wall, break the chain, and let him, let him out of it. In Acts 5, 19, an angel opened prison doors. So, they're not bound to, you know, this physical world like we are. But at the same time, they can interact with physical objects. But you also have angels that sinned. The angels that sinned. In 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So we know there are angels that sinned, Specifically here, it seems to be the ones who sinned in the days of the flood. And it says they're delivered and he del the Lord delivered them into chains of darkness. So this can't be regular chains because as you saw, they broke, they can break chains. You know, the chains that can keep man locked up couldn't keep an angel locked up. So the Lord has special chains for them. It says in 2 Peter 2, 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So you see this 2 Peter 2, 4, the angels that's been delivered into chains of darkness are associated with that days of Noah, that time of the flood. So <coughs> most likely this is the angels that sinned in the days of Noah, were the sons of God, which were angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. And they fornicated with human women. And they produced the giants. And once again, you see I'm associated with fornication in Jude 6 through 7. It says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness. There's those everlasting chains again. Unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now notice it's associating them with sexual perversion, associating them with Sodom and Gomorrah, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So, there's angels that sinned, left their first estate. And 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, Know you not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life. You see, most likely, me and you, we're replacing the sons of God, angels that rebelled. And then we're going to judge the ones that fell. Know you not that we shall judge angels. But you see that Angels are still, they still have interaction with the physical world and the church age today. Because in 1 Corinthians eleven ten it says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So you see, there's something about angels and them uh, being tempted by women. And they can still have uh, interaction with the physical world today. Even though it's nothing like it will be in the tribulation or in the Old Testament, there's still something there. Or we wouldn't be warned about it in the Pauline epistles. But another thing is angels eat. 
they can take on physical reality and even eat. In Psalm 78, 24 through 25, it says, And had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He called manna angels' food. So, I don't think that angels have to eat to keep going. Most likely just eating for pleasure. But there it talks about angels' food. And then when uh, the angels came to Lot in Genesis 19, it says, And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So Lot prepared a meal for the angels, and they ate in this physical world. So they can take on physical reality. Another thing about angels, they have limited knowledge. In Matthew twenty four thirty six, it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So they know a lot. Uh, Gabriel gave Daniel skill and understanding, but they don't know some things. It says in 1 Peter 1, 9 through 12, it says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, which the Holy Ghost with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now here's the key phrase, which things the angels desire to look into. You see, the angels desire to look into it. They don't have all the knowledge on it. Uh, could It could be the angels that fell are desiring to look into it. Maybe the some of the angels that have fallen are having remorse and they're desiring to look into redemption. Or possibly the angels of God in heaven who saw the angels fall and they couldn't be redeemed after they were fallen. So they desire to look into redemption for them. Yeah, uh, it's just so many unanswered questions regarding them. A lot of speculation goes into it. Uh, possibly it's the Angels that have fallen desire to look into that redemption. Maybe they do have, some of them do have remorse and they want to be redeemed. Maybe some of the angels are, who haven't fallen, are being tempted to fall and they look into that redemption. You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions about it. So they have, but they have limited knowledge, but they do have wisdom. In 2 Samuel 14, 20, it talks about it's according to the wisdom of an angel of God to know all things that are in the earth. So they do have wisdom. Gabriel gave Daniel skill and understanding and information that even Daniel didn't even have. And Daniel was one of the wisest men in the Bible. Daniel was so wise that, that, that Lucifer is said to be wiser than Daniel. So, <clears throat> they got a lot of brains, but they got limited knowledge. Next, they got limited power. In Romans eight thirty eight through 39, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, they got limited power. An angel can't separate me and, me and you from the love of God. It says in Second Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So there are some chains of darkness that they can't break free from. They, are, they got limited power. As powerful as angels are, the Lord can confine them in chains of darkness, including the devil. In Revelation 20, 1 through 2, it says, And I saw an angel 
come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So the devil has limited power. He's not all powerful. Only God is. Angels can control the weather. In Revelation 7, 1, it says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So you see that? The angel can control weather. Angels are created beings. In Colossians 1, 16, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So angels are created beings. Angels are clothed in white raiment. In John 20, 11 through 12, it says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she uh, stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. <clears throat> angels have eternal life. The ones that haven't sinned have eternal life. In Luke 20, 35 through 36, But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain the world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more. For they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So it said, Neither can they die any more. For they are equal unto the angels, showing you that also the angels couldn't die. The angels can be tempted. In Revelation 12, 4, it talks about how, talking about the dragon, and it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. It said he drew them. He, most likely, he, uh, through his subtlety, tricked them, bribed them, deceived them into going against the Lord. Most likely as the serpent did Eve. They seemed to be tempted in Genesis 6-2 when they saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 11-10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. The angels can be tempted. Um, angels have super strength. In Psalm 103-20 it says, Bless the Lord ye his angels that excel in strength. In Matthew 28, 2, the angel rolled the stone away. There is an innumerable amount of angels. In Matthew 26, 53, it says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. In Psalm 68, 17, it says, The chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Hebrews 12, 22, it talks about an innumerable company of angels. And like I said, angels in the Bible are called men. The angels that went to Sodom to deliver Lot were called men. In Genesis 18, 22, it calls them men. And it says, and the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. Talking about the angels. And they look so much like regular men that the men of Sodom wanted to know them in a perverted way. In Genesis 19, 5, it says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. In Revelation 21, 17, it says, And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Right there, it just plainly calls him a man. In Matthew twenty two thirty, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. This doesn't mean angels are sexless. It is that they don't marry. And they don't marry and because they're all men, and they don't marry because there's no need for them to make more. They don't need to procreate because they don't die. When they appear in the Bible... It calls them men or a young man. So why is this important? Because most things you see about angels today aren't actually the biblical version of angels. They, You see, the, the angels in the Bible look like regular men. They're never women. They don't have wings. They don't have halos. And you can entertain them unaware. And you'll hear a lot of stories from uh, preachers and people 
who claim to be apostles and they saw 50 foot angels but yet when they show up in the bible they just look like regular men they don't look like these people are describing angels in the bible are also referred to as stars in revelation 120 and in psalm 147 4 it says he telleth the number of the stars he calleth them all by their names and that i think that could be the the regular stars and angels i think they've all got names and god knows them all by names and has a relationship with all of them but there's angels in the tribulation in revelation 12 9 it talks about how the angels are cast out with the devil and they're going to wreak havoc you see the angels at the second coming in second thessalonians 1 7 it says unto you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. There's angels involved in the first part of the second coming at the rapture, and angels involved in the second part of the second coming coming back with him. 